morning. Um, so, uh, my name is Jim McCraw, I'm one of the attendings in the emergency department. Um, we're going to talk about pneumonia, wheeze, and asthma in the young child. You see this stuff all the time, it's very common, very confusing. Uh, this has been one of uh, one of my obsessions over the past you know, 15 years um, is trying to figure out when pneumonia is pneumonia, when wheeze is asthma, and things like that. It's a complicated story, um, uh, and hopefully uh, you get some uh, information out of this that can help you when you're seeing patients on the floor or in the ER, uh, wherever, you, wherever you work. So we're going to start with a case, 20-month-old male with two days of cough, difficulty breathing, temperature up to 102. He's got rhinorrhea, uh, moms are giving him cough and cold uh, syrup, which is not helping, um, and he has a past medical history of pneumonia times one. Have you guys ever seen a patient like this? This is like every day in the ER, sometimes three and four times a day, right? This is super common. Physical exam, he's uh, in respiratory distress, he does have a fever, and he's a little bit hypoxic. He's uh, moderate respiratory distress, got intercostal retraction, decreased air entry, left grade and right. Uh, you hear loud expiratory sounds. What are those? I don't know. You hear crackles bilaterally. The resident hears something entirely different from you. The RT hears something entirely different from both of you, right? So this is kind of a standard kit that we see very often. So in a kid like this, what would be your first thought? What would be your first concern in this kid, and what would you want to do with it? Anyone? Rule out pneumonia. Rule out pneumonia, right? So does this kid have pneumonia? So what we're going to be talking about in this lecture is how do we determine if this kid has pneumonia? And when we say pneumonia, what do we really mean? Chest x-ray. Well, chest x-ray, yes. And does this kid need antibiotics? So is this a bacterial process or is this a viral process? Okay. So that's what, what I'm really trying to um, figure out in this kid. Is it bacterial or is it viral? Um, anything else we want to do for this child besides an x-ray? Maybe some oxygen, right? Um, and the, the other thing is that, that residents and a lot of attendings um, actually step right over is this. Right? They're like, oh, he's had pneumonia in the past. What? Why is this kid in the hospital again for difficulty breathing and he's, pneumonia, he's had pneumonia in the past? That shouldn't happen. So we need to figure out what happened here, okay? So um, the most likely cause of this patient's presentation is strep pneumonia, human metapneumovirus, and yes, that's a real thing, yep. mycoplasma or staph aureus. Anyone have any guesses? Strep. Strep, okay? So strep is the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia that we see in children, okay? I would argue that this kid most likely has human metapneumovirus, and we're going to talk about why I think that is. Mycoplasma, not so common in little kids. Staph aureus, luckily, we don't see very often. That's a really horrendous pneumonia. Um, those kids are typically very sick. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll talk more about how I came to my conclusion as human metapneumovirus as most likely, um, uh, more likely than a bacterial pneumonia. Okay? All right, so our objectives are to ask all patients presenting with cough and difficulty breathing five important questions to help effectively and accurately make the diagnosis. Okay? Um, improve recognition of asthma in young children. Screen patients for presenting patterns of viral versus bacterial pneumonias. And use evidence-based medicine to improve care of the child with asthma exacerbation. So we'll talk about why, um, why we do some of the things we do for, the, for these children. Definition of asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways. They get reversible airflow obstruction, which means it gets better if you give them albuterol or, and or steroids, and sometimes it gets better just on its own, it's mild. Um, and bronchial hyperresponsiveness. So the bronchioles are really twitchy in kids with asthma. They tend to kind of overreact and clamp down. And that's when you get the coughing and the wheezing, difficulty breathing. Inflammation, is cause, inflammation causes the airways to overreact to a variety of stimuli. Viral URIs being the most common. Physical activity, changes in weather, we know these things, right? Cigarette smoke, allergens, all that stuff. 
The interaction can be highly variable among and within patients over time, so it's really a pretty heterogeneous disease. So, you know, they don't all act the same, and they don't all sound the same. And so that makes it more challenging to figure out some of these kids who maybe cough more than they wheeze. And so parents come in and say, oh my gosh, this, my kid's coughing all the time, coughing at night, and a lot of times doctors will say, oh, it's just a cold. Right? And parents get told this over and over again, um, and sometimes it's not just a quote. Um, one of the quotes I like in the literature is from, I think Dr. Weinberger is an allergist, um, in pediatrics uh, from 2007, the distinguishing characteristic of asthma is the response to bronchodilator or corticosteroids when the patient is symptomatic. Okay? So, in these kids who are coughing, having difficulty breathing, sometimes they don't have that classic wheeze that we um, expect. Sometimes they don't have any wheezing. Um, and so sometimes we have to go by the history as much as by the physical exam. What, what's the, what are the parents telling us in terms of uh, the kid's symptoms? <clears throat> Asthma is the most common chronic disease in childhood. At least 6.5 million kids in the United States are affected. Um, higher prevalence rates have been shown in other studies, especially in urban settings like Washington, D.C., um, down here, I think that's Washington. No, this Chicago, this one is from Washington, D.C. In surveys, they found higher prevalences. So 14% met criteria. They asked, they asked parents, does your kid ever cough at night? Does your kid ever wheeze? You know, that sort of thing. So 14% of kids um, had a diagnosis of asthma. And then when they asked parents about symptoms, another 10 to 15%, they concluded probably undiagnosed asthma. Okay? Um, so up to 25% of kids in, um, in some of these urban settings, which is, we're in an urban setting. So, Lots and lots of asthma, um, and lots of undiagnosed asthma. Morbidity and mortality, poor children are 40% more likely to have been hospitalized for asthma, and urban children often use ED as a source of primary care for their asthma. So this is something that um, um, we see all the time, and um, we, need to, we need to look for these kids and identify them and treat them appropriately. When do asthma symptoms begin? According to the National Asthma Education <coughs> and Prevention Program Guidelines, that's the um, uh, uh, guidelines, um, expert-based guidelines, uh, 50 to 80 percent of children with asthma have their first symptoms before the age of five. Initial symptoms of asthma in 25 percent were before six months of age, and, before, and, and 75 percent before three years of age. How many of you guys have heard the heard uh, the notion that you can't diagnose asthma in kids less than two. Why? Yeah, we'll talk about why in a minute. Yeah. So, so everyone heard that before? Can't diagnose asthma less than two. Do you guys still hear that in the wards? It's 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 becoming less. It was the standard teaching when um, I was in medical school and residency. Um, it's becoming less, but it's still a prominent thing that you hear parents say. Oh, the doctor said it was, uh, he was too young to be diagnosed with asthma. So there's no there's no lower age limit that you that you that you cannot diagnose asthma. At, okay. Um, the problem with well, let me talk about this first. So the NAAP guidelines also say um, asthma in early childhood is frequently underdiagnosed as pneumonia, bronchitis, URI, worry. Um, uh, so so this um, under recognition. Well, <clears throat> so when these young children with asthma, oftentimes they're getting kind of called pneumonia all the time, they're coming in for frequent um, evaluations in the ER, getting hospitalized, and they're getting diagnosed with pneumonia, worry, bronchiolitis, and it's really um, something we need to pay attention to, and that's why I pointed out in the first uh, case, um, <clears throat> that child has a history of pneumonia. So that's already a red flag to me that maybe there's something more going on in this child besides just two pneumonias, which Two bacterial pneumonias in a young, healthy child would be very unusual. Okay? So um, under recognition leads to all sorts of things, ER visits, hospitalizations, decreased quality of life for uh, families and patients, missed work, all sorts of things. <coughs> why is it so difficult? Why can't we just say, you know, if a kid comes in multiple times with wheezing, why can't we just say he has asthma? Well, the problem is that lots of kids wheeze in the first few years of life. One in three one of them had at least one episode of wheezing before the age of three. Um, the majority of these kids do not have asthma, and they do not develop asthma as they get older. Um, the complication is, as I said before, 
Most kids with asthma start early on in life. So you have all these wheezers coming in, and some of them, or a few of them, have asthma. And so trying to tease out which one of this, these kids is the asthmatic is, is very tricky and difficult. Um, and you know, we don't have a, a better way of identifying asthma in young children. <coughs> OK, so that's not right. Why so difficult? Well, we can't do pulmonary function tests in kids less than five. We just can't do it. They can't blow in the tube. They can't do it reliably. So we don't have a, an objective measure of, of uh, reversible uh, uh, airflow obstruction. So in little kids, the recommendations from the guidelines are, if you suspect asthma, you give a trial of therapy and see if they get better. If they're having frequent symptoms, it would be inhaled steroids, and you do that for four to six weeks or four to eight weeks, and you see if they get better. If they don't get better, then you start thinking, okay, is something else going on? Do we need to do more testing? Is this kid, you know, whatever. Um, so it's trial and error in young children and a good history and physical exam in response to therapy. Okay? So other things that make it difficult. They have confusing presentations. They have almost always have fevers because the most common cause of fevers in little kids are viruses, and the most common cause of wheezing in little kids are viruses. So they go together. So when you have a kid with a fever, and they're having difficulty breathing, and you hear stuff on their lungs, yeah, something's going on in their lungs. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have a bacterial pneumonia. In fact, when I hear crackles and wheezes and, and they're really working hard to breathe, First thing I'm thinking is this is probably a viral infection, not a bacterial infection, and that that's counterintuitive to what we've all learned um, in our studies. The problem with the way we study pneumonia in medical school and nursing school is that we learn adult pneumonia. We don't learn pediatric pneumonia. Right? Adult pneumonia is localized crackles, um, decreased breath sounds, fever. Right? That equals pneumonia, and most pneumonias in adults are bacterial. Right? In kids, totally the opposite. Most pneumonias are viral in kids less than five. Okay, so um, so you know, and then the breath sounds change all the time. Uh, you know, we hear crackles, we hear this, that, and the other thing. Um, so these are challenging exams, especially when the kids screaming their head off. Um, as we said, it's a heterogeneous disease. How do we know it's not just bronchiolitis? Uh, bronchiolitis is also a very common cause of um, difficulty breathing, especially in January and February. Every year we get an epidemic of it. Um, there are um, American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines for treating bronchiolitis, and the treatment recommendations for bronchiolitis from the AP are don't give albuterol, don't give steroids, simply, you know, um, supportive care only. So I'm sort of saying a little <coughs> different thing. I'm not talking about the two or three or six month old in February who comes in with a big snotty nose and <laughs> on your lung exam, okay? Those kids, I'm in mostly in agreement with the AP guidelines. But when you have a 20 month old come in and they're wheezing, we just had one last night, um, I'm gonna try a little bit harder in those kids. I might push the albuterol a little bit more, especially if the kid has certain things on his history, um, if he's done this in the past, you know, things like that. So, so when, the, the, when the mom says um, he had pneumonia in the past, my first question is, you know, not did he get antibiotics, but did they give him breathing treatments? Did, did they say he was wheezing? Did you think he was wheezing? Did, they, um, did the albuterol help? Okay. Um, and, and the answer to those can help, help, uh, help you in, in your assessment of the child now. Um, history, it requires patience um, and really detailed questioning. The parents are stressed out. Um, you know, does he have any past medical history? No. Has he ever had pneumonia before? Yes. Oh, okay. So, has he had um, difficulty breathing in the past? Have you been concerned about his breathing? Things like that. You have to ask a lot of questions. So, back to our first case. Um, <clears throat> this is the kid, 20 month old, with two days of cough, difficulty breathing, with pneumonia in the past, with wheezing and crackles all, the, all over the place. My first step is not to get a chest x-ray. My first step is to get more of a history. Okay. So this is where the five important questions come in. These are my five important questions. Uh, I find them very useful in terms of assessing these kids, and I do this on any kid who comes in with a parent who's saying he's 
coughing a lot or he's having trouble breathing. So has he ever wheezed or had breathing problems in the past? Does he have atopic dermatitis, eczema, or, or seasonal allergies? Is there any parental history of the asthma? When he's not sick, does he ever cough at night? When he's not sick, does he ever cough, wheeze, uh, cough or wheeze when he runs around? Right? And depending on the answer to these questions, I'm going to ask some more questions. But these are the five ones that I want to ask all, all, all parents. And I did not print out uh, copies of this lecture. I'm happy to send it to you guys or send it to Fran and she can distribute it to you guys. Um, so don't feel like you have to write all this stuff down. Um, if you miss something, it's okay. So where does this stuff come from? This comes from a study, um, which you can't really see very well, but this is a big study out of Tucson, where, uh, Tucson, Arizona, where they followed kids from birth, a large cohort of kids from birth, until they were um, school age, um, and tried to figure out, okay, which kids have asthma, and how can we figure out earlier when they, had asthma, when, when they, when they have asthma? Is there anything that we could use to predict which kids were going to develop asthma versus those which are not? And so it's called the Modified Asthma Predictive in Index. Um, if your kid has had wheezing, and that's a lot of wheezing, four wheezing episodes more than 24 hours in the last 12 months, plus a parent with asthma, so one major criteria or two minor criteria. Parent with asthma, a physician diagnosed with atopic dermatitis, allergic sensitization, you know, so um, seasonal allergic rhinitis or perennial allergic rhinitis, or two minor criteria, so if they're having symptoms when they don't have colds. Sometimes when parents come in, you say, oh, does he have a cold? No, he just started doing it. I don't know why he started doing it. That would be wheezing apart from colds. Um, food, um, food allergies. If you have a kid who's atopic or has a strong family history of atopia and they're doing this a lot, then I'm more likely to say in a 20-month-old, okay, I think your kid has asthma. Right? Could I be wrong? Yes, this is not perfect. Um, if you meet criteria, there's like a two-thirds 67% chance that when you're six or seven and they can do pulmonary function tests on you, that you will have asthma. If you don't have, if you don't meet criteria, then it's likely that you're not going to have asthma when you're five or six or seven or eight. Okay? So we see lots of kids who come in with wheezing and every time they get a cold they wheeze. Mom, any history of asthma in the family? Nope. Any eczema? Nope. You know, um, in those kids you can say, well, this is probably going to go away as you get older. Um, and as his, as his airways get bigger, um, and, but it's always kind of an open question, right? So this just is kind of a guide in terms of, okay, who am I going to really push um, asthma therapy on? Who might I not? And who am I going to say, okay, your child, I'm comfortable saying, has asthma this time. Um, so history of pneumonia, we talked about this, and he wheezed with his first episode. If so, did they help? Mom says, yes, he did wheeze, and they gave him albuterol, and it really helped. In fact, they sent him home with an albuterol nebulizer. Uh, the pneumonia was hospitalized at eight months. Um, he had the exact same symptoms he has now, and the albuterol did help. Um, he's also been diagnosed with bronchi bronchitis by his doctor. They gave him albuterol nebulizations and some antibiotics a couple months ago at his doctor. So we're going from a kid who's presenting with an episode of difficulty breathing, one episode, now he's got a history of, now this is his third time. So he's done this over and over again. That's concerning. Questions to ask, does your child have eczema? Okay, eczema is a funny one. I think egg, people label lots of dry rashes as eczema. Um, so you hear parents say, oh yeah, he's got eczema. Okay, well, tell me about the eczema. You know, and parents say, oh, it's a little dry patch back here. Does it bother him or does it bother you more? It bothers us. It doesn't seem to bother him at all. That's not the atopic dermatitis eczema that is, is related as an atopic disease to asthma. It's eczema, the defining feature of eczema is it's really itchy and annoying um, and it's in typical um, areas. And when you say, mom, does your child have any past medical problems? No. Does your child have eczema? Yes. So parents don't really think of eczema as a medical problem. Or, or at least when the kid's wheezing, they're not, that's not the first thing that comes to mind. And so this, so you'll see kids, um, any medical problems? No. And then, and then parents will say, well, are you, any eczema? And they lift up the arms and you see stuff like this. It's like, okay, this looks like eczema, right? Um, so that's a, that's a question that can sort of um, help you in terms of, is this an atopic child um, and is this likely to occur? 
family history. If you have a parent with asthma, your likelihood of developing asthma during your lifetime is pretty substantial. If, you have, if, one, if one parent has a um, history of some atopic disease, the child's chance of developing an atopic disease is like 30 to 50 percent. If both parents have, have um, ATP, then the kid's chance are like 60 to 80 percent. Right? So allergy, asthma, eczema are all familial um, diseases. And mom, so mom did have asthma as a child, and she had allergic rhinitis. So that's a point for, for, um, for in your modified asthma particularly there. <coughs> Quantification of chronic symptoms, I find giving parents a multiple choice test is the best way to get a useful answer. If you say, mom, does he ever cough when he's not sick? Does he ever wheeze when he runs around when he's not sick? It's very vague and parents don't know what to do with it. If you say, on the other hand, mom, when he's not sick, over the past month or two, does he ever cough to the point of waking up at night or have symptoms at night that, that disrupts his sleep? If the answer is yes, okay, give me a number over the past one or two months. <clears throat> one night a week, two nights a week, one night a month, more or less. Every night, you know, um, if they say, you know, every night, if they say no, you know, that's, that's useful. Same thing with wheezing and cough when they're running around, right? These are sort of shortcut questions, um, but I find them useful in terms of gauging um, how bad the kid's problem is. And we have kids, parents will come in and say, oh yeah, he coughs three or four nights per week to the point of waking up, even when he's not sick. How long has that been going on? Years? You know, if you have kids, you know what it's like when your kids don't sleep at night. That is bad, right? So, um, so three or four nights per week all the time is, is, that's certainly not normal, okay? This is a confusing slide. I don't want to make too much of it, but this is how we diagnose and how we um, classify asthma severity. Um, when we talk about impairment, that's the nighttime awakenings, uh, interference with normal activity, how often are you using your albuterol <coughs> every week when you're not sick. Then there's this risk category, I'm sorry it's not showing up very well. Risk category was added to the 2007 guidelines, um, and a severe exacerbation was, that was, um, was uh, identified by exacerbations that are so bad you need oral steroids. Okay. Um, and so you can have one episode a year requiring steroids or going to the emergency department um, and be an intermittent asthmatic. But if you have two or more, that even if you don't have symptoms when you're when you're not sick, that bumps you into the mild, the mild persistent or the persistent category. Okay. Um, <coughs> notice in young children, nighttime awakenings zero is allowed. So if the kid's coughing to the point of waking up with, when they're not sick. One to two nights a month, that's a problem. Okay, um, and it, for mild, moderate, persist or severe persistent asthma, that I think is for the primary care doctors and the pulmonologists. In the ER, what I really care about is are they persistent or are they intermittent? If you think about it, if you go to the ER, that's a, that's one a year, right? You're already you're already on in the range where I'm going to be like you're very you have a good chance of being persistent. And if per the difference between persistent and intermittent is inhaled steroids, daily inhaled steroids. And so um, studies have shown that if you have a kid who shows up in the ER has 35, upwards of 75% chance of having persistent asthma. And so if they're not on inhaled steroids or the parents aren't giving them every day, that's a, that's a problem, right? And, and the red is what our kid has. <coughs> if you go by the most severe category, so he really is meeting criteria for severe persistent asthma at this point. Okay? All right, so in this case, personally, I would not get a chest x-ray on him. Um, I've gotten a million chest x-rays on kids like this in the past, and they're just not that useful. In fact, I think they make things more confusing. Um, and there is uh, literature to, um, to support me in that notion. Um, I don't have a problem with physicians and providers getting x-rays on kids like this. The problem is in the interpretation of the x-rays once they get them. Okay? So I would give this kid a trial of albuterol, probably an hour. We have our new asthma um, uh, algorithm in the ER that we're using. I would give him an hour of albuterol. Um, I would give him steroids, and I'd come back and take a look at him. And look at him. He's running around the room. 
mom's annoyed now. You always know it's time for the kid to go home. When the mom's like, sit down. Right? So um, he improved air entry, no retractions, um, no wheezes. He's still got a few scattered bras bilateral. Okay? So someone will get a chest x-ray on this kid, and that's OK. Um, it's not the, it doesn't show up at the best. But does anyone see anything? So if you look on here, it's very common for, for us to get referrals, and they'll say, I, the doc will say, I think he's got a little pneumonia developing here, an early pneumonia. So I give him antibiotics, right? This is actually normal hilum. This is bron your, your pulmonary bronchi um, and vessels. Um, this is also hilum, okay? Um, and so, you know, you have to interpret this film. And the interpretation of the film often is atelectasis versus pneumonia correlate clinically. Guess how many times the doctors tell patient parents that their kid has atelectasis on their x-ray? It doesn't happen. They say, I think your kid has pneumonia, let's give him some antibiotics. Okay? So that's why you want to be careful about getting x-rays. If you get x-rays, you want to be careful about how you interpret them. Right? So this kid, a lot of kids I see with wheezing, I, I tell parents, I don't know what, I don't, I'm not going to call your kid asthma at this time because you don't have a family history. He's only done this a couple times. I do use the term WARI, which is wheezing associated respiratory infection, a lot. I kind of like that diagnosis. I like it better than reactive airway disease, which I think is just nonspecific and confusing. Um, and, but in a kid like this who has, who has a history of eczema, who's wheezed, this is his third time doing it, and he's having all these symptoms when he's not sick. I feel very comfortable saying your kid has asthma, persistent asthma, and we're going to treat him like that. And if he doesn't get better in a month, I want you to talk to your doctor about getting in to see a pulmonologist. Okay? Because then if he doesn't respond to our therapy, then we need to start thinking is there something else going on. I would give him, well, this is, this is a little bit old. I wouldn't do prednisone, we do Decadron now. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I would give him albuterol to go home with. And I would initiate daily inhaled steroids for this kid in the ER. Okay? Um, any questions about that? Okay. All right. Case two is an almost four-year-old girl with a uh, past life history of UTI times two with abdominal pain and fever to 102.4 for 10 hours. The abdominal pain is intermittent, it wakes the patient from sleep, periumbilical in location, <coughs> no vomiting or diarrhea. This kid looks sick. She's febrile, tachycardic. She's breathing a little bit fast. She's ill-appearing, looks uncomfortable. Chest is clear. Abdomen, she has diffused tenderness over the right middle and lower abdomen. Um, she's got guarding but no rebound. The rest of her exam is normal. What do you think about this kid? Asthma? It's not like asthma, right? This is a kid that I, I thought had a ruptured appendicitis, right? Young kids, we don't see appendicitis that often, um, less than five. When we see them, they're oftentimes ruptured for, for unclear reasons. Um, and I was worried. I, I really thought she had a ruptured abdomen. Her white count was 26, which also went along with that. Um, and this is a while ago. It was before we were routinely doing ultrasounds for, for appendicitis. So we called surgery, and they're like, yeah, we need a CAT scan. Um, that was going to take a little while. So I got um, acute abdominal series just to see if I saw anything on the belly. And this was the, <coughs> and as part of your acute abdominal series, a chest x-ray is part of, of your uh, completed abdominal series. Anyone see anything here that looks amiss? So right here, so right here, something's going on here, right? This looks much different than our last film, right? This is a pretty impressive infiltrate. Could it be atelectasis? I guess, um, you know, but there's something going on. There. No cough, no rowels. You listen to her lungs again, clear. So what's going on in this kid? Oh, the CAT scan was negative. We got the CAT scan, the appendix was normal. Most likely the cause of this patient's presentation, same, same players. Anyone have any guesses? So this is actually a fairly classic case of strep pneumonia pneumonia. Young children with pneumonia, with bacterial pneumonia, oftentimes present without clear respiratory symptoms. We call them occult pneumonias. Okay? And really significant abdominal pain can be um, a presentation of these children. So she had rapid onset of high fever, looking sicker than you know 95% of the kids we see, um, 
and we gave her antibiotics, she got admitted to the hospital, and she went home the next day. Okay? So that a classic strep pneumonia case. Um, and the fact that she didn't have anything on the lungs is annoying and frustrating, but known to have. All right, pneumonia, we're going to talk a little bit about pneumonia. Most common uh, of all age groups, <coughs> pneumonia is most common in kids less than five. Um, it's less common as kids get older. And age of the patient is really important when you're trying to figure out, is this a virus, is it a bacteria, what is going on, what's causing this pneumonia. Viral versus bacterial versus atypical, atypical is being mycoplasma and chlamydia. Um, it's, your guess is as good as mine. Um, the problem is, we, testing, we don't have great testing to figure out pneumonias in these kids. Um, Co-infections are common, so you can have a virus and a bacteria kind of teaming up. Um, you can have kids, you've probably seen respiratory viral panels with three viruses that are positive. That's not uncommon. Is, is the kid colonized? Is the kid have two infections? You know, it's, it's very unclear a lot of times. Blood cultures are terrible for, for pneumonia. Up to only about 2 to 10% will be positive, um, even strep pneumonia. Sputum samples, thoracentesis, we rarely get those things. Um, and so a lot of times we just don't know. We're not sure what's going on, and hopefully our testing will get better that we'll come up with new ways to figure out um, what the etiology of these diseases are. But right now, in Forever, we've been kind of limited to presenting symptoms. Okay? This is a study, um, there are lots of studies out there about the value of clinical features in, in figuring out which kid has a bacterial versus a viral pneumonia. If you look at this, this is like um, 100, 100 some kids this is in Finland, um, and, they just, and they, the kid got a diagnosed with pneumonia, and they did all sorts of testing to try and figure out what the cause was. If you look at it, about a quarter or more, we never figured out what caused it, right? So, um, and that's pretty typical in these studies. Crackles, 50% of kids with strep pneumo had crackles. 67% of viral pneumonias had crackles, right? So crackles really didn't help at all. Um, and that's why in young children, when I hear crackles, especially if it's diffuse or if it's changing, you hear it on the right side and you hear it on the left side, that's more likely to be a virus. Okay. Alveolar infiltrates, right? the second kid we had had an alveolar infiltrate. That was seen more commonly in, in strep pneumo, but still seen in almost half of the kids with virus disease, right? Um, and was seen, alveolar infiltrates was commonly seen in mycoplasma. A common misconception of mycoplasma is that you get interstitial infiltrates, not, not alveolar, not those big um, um, lobar infiltrates. And that's not true. Kids with mycoplasma can get lobar infiltrates. Okay. All right. Caused by age, viruses are most common in young children. Strep is most common. Bacteria in young children. Mycoplasma is felt to be less common. Um, I, my personal feeling, well, my personal feeling and um, and and reports in the literature are that we're seeing less pneumonia than we used to since Prevnar came in. You know, I used to see more of those children, like the second case, um, back in the early 2000s, uh, before Prevnar was introduced in 2006. Okay. Um, okay, older kids, as they get to be teenagers, mycoplasma becomes the most common cause of pneumonia. Um, it can cause lobar pneumonias, and, and mycoplasma, as opposed to strep pneumonia, can trigger wheezing. Where strep pneumonia really is not, the body doesn't respond to bacteria like they do to viruses. <coughs> viruses are what make you wheeze, typically. Um, mycoplasma can make you wheeze. Okay? Um, and bacterial strep pneumonia still accounts for maybe a third of the cases. And viruses are less common as you get older. It can still happen. So bacterial pneumonia in young patients often young patients often lack specific signs of a lower respiratory tract infection. They may present with just high fever, ill appearance, abdominal pain, vomiting, tachypnea, and cough without lung findings. Um, there are recommendations out from the Infectious Disease Society of America um, on when to get how to manage pneumonia in children, community acquired pneumonia. Their recommendations in kids less than five is if you suspect community acquired pneumonia in a child, don't get an x ray and don't put them on antibiotics. What? Right? That is not what we learn in school. But that's because most of these are viruses. Okay? The question is okay, well, when do, I, when, do I, when do I presume a bacterial infection? And that's when, you know, that's when you have to you know, have a high index of suspicion and 
other things like that. So, all right. So cold pneumonias. There have been studies on a cold pneumonia looking at febrile kids less than five. With um, if a febrile child less than five had leukocytosis, a large percentage of them had pneumonia, even without respiratory symptoms. If a kid had 20, 25,000, there was a 26% instance of a cold pneumonia. So our kid had a 26,000 uh, white count, no lung symptoms, and a pulmonary infiltrate. So we call them a cult because on exam, you don't suspect a pneumonia. Okay. All right. So I find this chart to be really useful um, in terms of helping me when I'm trying to figure out what's going on with the child. Viral versus bacterial viruses, they tend to have a lot of URI symptoms. Um, they have respiratory distress, retractions, rowels, wheezing, okay, all the things that our first kid had. Versus bacterial, rapid onset, toxic appearance, rigor, they look sicker than your average kid, absence of respiratory distress, um, unless they have a large effusion, which is pretty rare. Um, absence of wheezing goes for bacteria. This is actually, you can find this on up to date. They use, for the, in the pediatric pneumonia article, they, they um, this is cited in, in up to date. So it's still really one of the better tools, of the bad tools we have, to figure out what's causing pneumonia in, in young children. Low bar consolidation. So if, if the kid, if the kid in the first case had an x ray that looked like the kid in the second case, right? So if that kid with wheezing and crackles all over the place had a big, ugly, low bar looking infiltrate, I would treat him with antibiotics. Okay? I would also treat them with steroids and albuterol, but I would cover them for antibiotics because, okay, that's a pretty impressive infiltrate, I'm gonna treat that. And occasionally you see that. Remember, viruses can cause low bar infiltrates too. So, uh, but if I do see an x-ray that's impressive, I'm gonna treat them for a bacterial infection, but I also treat them, for, if the story's right, I also treat them with steroids and, um, and albuterol. Okay? Uh, case four, or case three, I'm sorry, is a four-year-old male, history of Down syndrome, and asthma, comes in with a fever, cough, congestion times three days. He was diagnosed by the private physician or some outside urgent care with hepatitis media a couple days ago. A match was started, but the patient won't take it, keeps spitting in dad's face, and dad is pretty mad. He's one of those guys who comes in and, you know, hey, dad, I'm sorry about your weight, how you doing? Um, what's going on? So he doesn't want to hear the story. He's sick, right? I go, okay, sorry. Um, so, in this kid, um, this, I saw this with a fellow back in my days in Columbus, Ohio, um, and she's like, well, I think he has a pneumonia because he's got these high fevers and he's coughing a lot, and I'm like, okay. Um, and she also, and, oh, and, and when you go and look in his ears to see if he's got an ear infection, he has so much wax in his ears, it's unclear how anyone could see past that to see an ear infection. When we dug the wax out, he did not have an ear infection. Um, but he is, you know, he looks ill but non toxic. He's kind of sitting there droopy. Um, his pulse ox is okay. Um, and his lungs sound clear on the fellow's exam when they report to you. Okay? So the fellow got an x ray, which was okay. And this is what it showed. You guys see this one. So he's got a lot of streaky stuff, which is probably normal lung markings. Maybe it's a little fuller here in the right hilum than you expect, um, but nothing really grabbing you, right? Nothing that impressive. And this is a very common thing that we see in the